church not too far away, but long, long ago. I guess I should have started long, long ago and not too far away. It was an elder that decided that he had found something in Scripture that had been hidden before and that he alone had uncovered uh, the truth of God about communion. And the truth that he found was that in order to truly please God, you had to use wine rather than grape juice. In a variety of reasons, mostly around the fact that this took place during Passover. And at Passover time, uh, you were required to make sure your house was completely clear of all yeast. And yeast is naturally occurring in grapes. The only way that to make sure that grapes or grape juice are completely uh, free of yeast is to have it fermented. And so he, he had some scientific evidence and he had some, uh, some uh, statements by some Jewish rabbis. And he was convinced that just like having to use unleavened bread in communion, you had to use fermented wine. And so one Sunday, without telling anybody else in the church, he replaced the Welches with Mogan David. And uh, people noticed strangely enough, and not everybody appreciated his audacity for one thing or his reasoning for another. I mean, when you think about it, to try to use communion as a, uh, or the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, where Jesus, inst- as a model that has to be followed exactly, uh, you sort of get in trouble there because Jesus and the apostles reclined around a table. The text tells us that. And they did communion after a meal together. Why not use that as the, the pattern? And, and um, it was in an upper room. I heard somebody say one time, you really can't do scripture, scriptural communion unless you do it on a second story. Remember in Acts 20 and verse 7, which we use as the, the pattern for every, day, you know, every first day of the week? Uh, it was in an upper room, just like Jesus when he instituted it was in an upper room. So if you're in a basement or on the first floor, you're not doing scripture correctly. You're not following the pattern. And by the way, the word that is translated in both the gospel accounts and also in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 11 is the Greek word for bread, not the specific word unleavened bread. In some religious traditions, they use loaf bread because that's the word that was used. You see, you sort of get sort of wrapped around the axle when you uh, try to make sure that you follow the exact pattern because sometimes that pattern is a little bit hard to decipher exactly what is the most important thing. But then again, we know what the most important thing is, right? Jesus didn't ask us to be completely perfect in our interpretations and our actions He did tell us to love one another, that the great command is for us to love one another. In fact, he told the apostles in John 13, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. He tells us that people will know we're following him not by uh, the uh, preciseness of our presentation, but rather by the fact that we love one another. In John 17, he says pretty much the same thing. He prays to the Father that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. That our message, our testimony to the world doesn't depend on our presentation, but rather our love for one another. He repeats the same thing just a verse later. I and you, so that, and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. When has that ever happened in the history of the church? So they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you've loved me. That what Jesus asks for is for us not to necessarily replicate some hidden theological truth, but rather that we live together in a community that loves him and loves one another and loves the world that we have been sent to uh, minister to. The great command is for us to love one another. Well, sometimes that's the first thing that gets thrown under the bus when there's a difference of opinion in church. In that church that I was referring to, that came to a head, and people, the very first thing they forgot about 
was how much they were supposed to love one another. The only thing that mattered was being right and proving the other person is right. And if you have to humiliate them in the process to prove you're right, again, Christ prayed to the Father and urges his disciples, we show the world that we are followers of Jesus by the way that we love one another. Sometimes the best way to do that is to do what uh, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 in verse 23. Have, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. You see, you get in those fights, you get in those fusses, he says, because you know they produce quarrels. Sometimes the pursuit of being absolutely right, we go about it in the wrong way, and it simply causes divisions among us. Okay, this morning we come to uh, the beginning of our look at the seven churches of Asia. Last week we introduced the vision with which the book of Revelation begins with as Jesus appears in, in this impressionist vision where his hair is white to, and his, his eyes are blazing fire and, and the sword is coming out of his mouth showing the churches that he is still uh, the one that rules the universe but in that vision, he is walking among the candlesticks, among the lampstands that represent his churches. In his, in his hand, he holds seven stars, which are the messengers to those seven churches. And he begins the book by writing letters to each of the churches of Asia Minor, what we would now call Turkey. These churches, some that we know a lot about, some we don't know anything about, other than Jesus has a message. This is the only part of the New Testament that Jesus himself dictates. And he writes it to his churches. And the point is, well, as he writes it to these churches, he's also writing to us. So we're looking for points of contact where the message of the, to the churches is also messages to us. He begins with Ephesus. Um, let's begin by simply reading the letter to the church at Ephesus, and then we'll unpack it just a bit. Good morning, church. How's everybody doing? To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These are the words of whom holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever his ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who is victorious. I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. I'll try to give you more uh, warning next time, Travis. See, when you have to read in the middle of the sermon, that means you've got to stay awake at least halfway through the, the sermon until, you're, until you hit your cue. Ephesus was an important place. It was one of the uh, three great cities of the empire, along with Rome and Alexandria. Ephesus was probably the next of the great cities of the Roman Empire. It was wealthy. It was an a education and cultural center. It was also a place where Paul came to establish a, a church on his second missionary journey. He returns there on his third missionary journey. He stays there for three and a half years, by far the longest of his local works. He knows this uh, church well. It, it, he, the closeness that he has with Ephesus is seen. Then when Paul is told that he's, he's going to be arrested, he thinks he's going to die. He's going back to Jerusalem. He calls for the elders of the church at Ephesus to meet him at Miletus to uh, have this last farewell uh, time. And he spends most of a chapter talking with them uh, that one last time. Timothy was appointed to stay in the church at Ephesus 
primarily to help the church there stay away from certain false doctrines. So Paul begins 1 Timothy by writing, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. So Timothy's main job, stay in Ephesus, again, where Paul had stayed for so long, and he is to help them stay away from certain things because there's some people there that wanted to be teachers, but they didn't know what they were talking about. So Paul says a little bit later in the same chapter, some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law. They want to be seen as rabbis, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. So Timothy's job is to stay there in Ephesus and to help the church stay on the straight and narrow. In fact, a little bit later in the book, he's told to appoint elders. And then a couple chapters later, he's told to disappoint elders. It's Timothy's job. If some of the elders aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, he is to rebuke them publicly. I can't imagine doing that. But I do understand why two verses later, Paul tells Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach's sake. Timothy had a very difficult job there. But the reason we emphasize that is that as we read in Revelation, Timothy does a good job. He's to stay in Ephesus and to make sure they stay on the straight and narrow. And one of the things that Ephesus was known for was staying on the straight and narrow. They were for the truth of the gospel. So Jesus says to them, I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles and are not and have found them false. A little bit later, he says that you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So Jesus begins the letter to the Ephesians by saying, you're doing a good job staying focused on the truth. You, you recognize there are some people that claim to be apostles, but they're not, and you reject them as false. And these people of these Nicolaitans, we have no idea who the Nicolaitans were or what they taught. Now, you can test me on this if you, if you can find a, a commentary on Revelation. Most commentators will spend three and a half pages telling you that they don't know anything at all about the Nicolaitans. But they've got guesses, so we, we can make some guesses, but we don't know. But here's something to keep in mind, though, if we think of Jesus as sort of meek and mild and doesn't, you know, sort of accepts everybody, he doesn't accept the Nicolaitans. He says, he doesn't hate them, he says, but I hate their practices. And you are doing good as far as I'm concerned because you hate their practices as well. They are staying on the straight and narrow. They are commended for the good work they're doing, but you know, a lot of these letters are going to have a, you know, I mentioned earlier that when you're going to give a criticism, wrap it in some compliments. Well, Jesus does that here. He gives them some compliments. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. You're persevering. It's not just on paper either. They have persevered and have endured hardships in mind. The, the church is not just ivory tower theologians who have it right. They've got skin in the game. They've been persecuted. They've gone through some hardships. We know in Acts there was a big riot caused by some of the pagans who were afraid that the church was taken away from the business at the temple and caused the church some problems. So that evidently is continuing. Jesus says, you're doing great, but there's one thing I have against you. Hold this against you. You have forsaken the love that you had at first. You've forsaken your first love. They're right, doctrinally. They've got the truth parsed out. They're persevering. He even says, they're not just going through the motions because he says they, um, they are persevering. But the problem is, all of the good things that they're doing, all of the truth they're defending, they're not connecting it to their love for God and for Christ as they should. Problem the church has had for a long time. It was what the, the problem the Jews had in the Old Testament. The Jews thought that as long as they got church right, as long as they did the religious stuff, they did the right sacrifices, they did the right festivals, they did the right fasts, as long as they did the pomp and ceremony of religion right, that's what God wanted. 
And then they were free to live their life the way that they want. And God says, I, the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. If I don't have your heart, as we just sang about a moment ago, if you don't give me your heart, then your sacrifices don't mean anything. Here's what Isaiah says as he opens the book of Isaiah. The multitude, this is God speaking, Isaiah is just writing it down. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord. I have more than enough of burnt offerings and rams and the fat of fatted animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. That's what they're focusing on. They think that if they get all of that right, that's what matters. But Isaiah continues, verse 16, Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. True religion, James says, is about taking care of widows and orphans in their distress. That if you want to show that, that, what, that I matter more than idols, then don't just give me church. Show me that your lives are transformed and that your heart reflects my heart. Love the people that I love. Be concerned about the things that I'm concerned about. This is the same sheet of music that Amos and Micah and Hosea and the rest of the prophets are singing from. And it's not just a problem in the Old Testament as well. It's a problem that we see uh, cropping up in the New Testament. Just one example from Corinth. Corinth was a church with a lot of problems, and most of their problems related to different causes, but the effect was the same. They had a problem with unity. They had a problem loving one another. It was a Jew-Gentile thing. It was a rich-poor thing. Uh, but this particular example, as he deals with it in chapters 12, 13, and, and 14, had to do with spiritual gifts. People argued about what it was that was most important for the church. One group said, well, there's nothing more important than my gift. My gift is that God speaks to me, and as a prophet, then I speak to the, to the church. There's nothing more important than prophecy. The tongue speaker says, yeah, well, God does that to me too, but I deliver it in Chinese. That's even more impressive. And so back and forth they went. Paul deals with that, and he said, why don't you folks... If you're going to desire gifts, if you're going to emphasize gifts, why don't you desire the most important gifts? And then he says, no matter what your gift is, if it's prophecy or if it's tongue speaking, those are the two he mentions because that's the people that are fussing and fighting there. If it was here, it might be preaching or leading worship or organizing programs or you know, teaching classes, whatever. Whatever gift we think we have, he may mention that one. And he says, if it's not done with love, then it's just a bunch of noise. In fact, listen to what he says. Chapter 13. This is right after he tells them to desire the greater gifts. And then he says, I'm going to show you the more excellent way. And then he says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I'm such a great tongue speaker, then not only do I speak in Chinese, but I speak in angelic language. If I'm not doing that out of love, I'm just making noise, he says. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith to move mountains and don't have love, I am nothing. If I'm such a great prophet that not only do I reveal the word of God, I can understand all the mysteries of God. But if I do that without love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, give over my body to hardship so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. If I'm persecuted because of my faith, if it's not motivated by love, then it doesn't mean anything. What Jesus tells the church at Ephesus is that you're doing a lot of things, you've just allowed those things to come unhooked from the love that you had at first. We do understand, we say it, we, we sing it, we, we, we often refer to it, that the greatest commands of the Bible is to love God and love others. Jesus was asked specifically, what are the two commandments? Or what is the greatest commandment of the law? And he said, well, there's two. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. 
Love your neighbor as yourself. What's the greatest command? Well, there's two, and they're both love. He says that love, Paul tells us that love is at the very heart of the law. This is actually mentioned several places in the New Testament. Here in Galatians 5, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Wouldn't need a lot of rules and regulations if we loved each other the way that we should. Because love would guide every decision and, and, and would cause us to put the first thing first, where often we put ourselves first. Love sums up everything and binds together everything that God requires. After listing a bunch of virtues that we are to add to ourselves as we grow, he says in Colossians 3.14, And over all of these virtues put on love, which binds them all together. Patience and kindness and goodness, all these other things, I wrap them all together and tie them up into a nice package by the way that I love. In fact, it is love that binds us together. Above all, Peter says, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. We will never be able to agree on everything as far as the way the church should be doing stuff. As much as we study and as much as we research, we're always going to have differences of opinions about the way things should be. And, and there are going to be people whose personalities are going to clash. Okay, look around the auditorium this morning. Who's the most irritating person that you see? I didn't. Well, I wasn't asking for volunteers, but thanks anyway, Troy. Um, there are going to be folks that we're just going to have a hard time getting along with because our personalities clash. Maybe they're a very detail-oriented person that's got to have everything planned to the nth degree, and we tend to be kind of loosey-goosey and, and you know. Um, I demonstrated this morning. You know, and Renee called and asked if she wanted to, if she could do an announcement, and and so I put it in the. I like spontaneity as long as you plan it out sufficiently. You see. There's things about our personalities that, that have a hard time meshing together. So it's the way it is in every family. And it's certainly that way in a family this large. But if we have love that binds us together regardless of those differences. That's why the greatest of these is love. The church at Ephesus was struggling with the most important thing. They were doing some good things, and Jesus commends them for doing these great things. And he wants them to continue to do those great things. In fact, he expects them to continue to do those great things. But you need to remember, he says, remember the way it was at the beginning. Remember the love that you did have for one another. The, the, remember the, the, the excitement that you had. Rem That's what I want. I want you to connect these good things that you're doing and these good things that are important to you to the love that you had at the first. I want you to love me with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I want you to love one another as you love yourselves. And then get about the business of doing church. You have forgotten your first love. And so then he's going to go on to uh, give them some things they need to do. Remember, remember I said that T Timothy was um, told to stay at Ephesus to teach certain people not to teach false doctrine anymore. That was his job. But Paul warns him right after he says, have nothing to do with foolish and stupid arguments. He continues that thought like this. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. So even Timothy's job is to keep people from, from going away into false doctrine. But Paul says, I want you to remember, however, your job isn't to win arguments. Your job is to gently and meekly and humbly lead people. 
And we could win a lot of arguments and chase away a lot of folks. The love is always the most important thing. Even as we deal with problems, we have to deal with it out of love. So here's Christ's call to action. If, in Revelation 2 verse 5. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things that you did at first. If you repent, I will come to you. And if you don't repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Okay, so there's actually three things there. Originally, I was going to get real clever and uh, put them all, you know, repent, uh, uh, remember, repent, and uh, re re renew. But I could never remember the order of those. So we'll just look at it the way that Jesus says it. Consider how far you've fallen. Remember the way things used to be. Remember how things were when you first were in... Now, this isn't just sappy sentiment, you know, back in the good old days. We used to, you know... That is not what he's really suggesting. He can say, remember the way that church was and compare it to the way that it is and see if you can see the difference. Remember the focus that you had, not just on the truth, but connecting that truth to me. Remember the focus that you used to have. Remember how you used to love those potlucks that you had together and, and, and now you've allowed those animosity, those, those personality conflicts to cause those. Remember what it used to be. In, in Romans 6, Paul tells the, uh, the church at Rome to remember about their baptism. Now, he's just said in chapter 6, verse 1, that um, shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? Um, and, and then he that kind of goes into this. He says this, Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have a new life. What he's saying is grace doesn't mean that we can live any way that we want, but rather grace means that we've stepped into a story. And to some who were dismissing his doctrine of grace by saying, well, that means we can live any way we want, he says, uh-uh. Remember, you were baptized. You stepped into this Christ story. You um, died to your sin, and you were buried in water, and you came up out of the water, resurrected to a new life. This isn't why baptism is an important thing for us to remember. And we all need to reflect back upon that time, no matter how long ago it was. That's why I think it's so important that it's believers that are baptized and not babies. We need to remember that point in time where we signed the contract, where we stepped into the story, where we put on Christ. And Paul says, okay, now remember you were baptized, now live that way. You stepped into this story, now continue to live in it. So that's in reality what he's telling the church at Ephesus. Remember the connection that you had to me and to this wider story and recapture some of that. Because if you don't, it's going to be bad. So the second point he makes is repent. And then he says, if you don't repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand. Remember the opening vision of the book. There's this uh, image of Jesus and this impressionist you know, thing we talked about where he's got hair that's bright white and, and, and representing purity and holiness and his eyes are blazing and under, he sees and understands what's going on and the sword of judgment comes out of his mouth and that's an impressive view but we need to remember where he is he's walking among the candlesticks among the lampstands that represent the churches at the end of chapter 1 we're told that the lampstands represent the church and so here, Jesus says, if you don't repent, I'm going to come and take away your lampstand. If you're not going to shine your light, then I'm going to take away the church. See, the lampstand represents the church. Repentance is not just for murderers and adulterers and idolaters. And it's for all of us. We all need to, to repent. We all need to consider where we are now and where we once were. 
And if we're not somewhere on an incline, getting closer and closer to God, then we need to repent and go back and reconnect with who it was, uh, that, uh, what it was when we were close to God. Repentance is at the center of the message of the gospel. Remember when, when the gospel got started, uh, Mark's telling his story. He skips the birth stories. He has John show up, and John's message was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then after John is put in prison, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he says. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So Mark chooses to sum up the whole message of Christ. Repent and believe the good news. That's still the essence of Christianity. We need to look at ourselves and we need to go back and repent and be closer and closer to what it is that God is calling us to be. And then finally, he says, not just repent, but do the things that you did at the first. What was it for you when you first became a Christian? Now, I know some of you grew up in the church and you're excuse me, your memory is more of a, a process where you always knew faith that you got to the point where now, um, now you're, the faith is your own, you're going to claim it for yourself. I remember I was not even quite 10 years old, uh, May 11th, 1968. I, um, it would have been 66, I w- went to the front on a Wednesday night And my memory of that time is so how relieved I was when that was over. You know, walking up in front of everybody. The baptism part was easy. It was walking up front of of everybody that was a difficult part. But every once in a while, you need to remember that story. And then you need to remember afterwards the way that you felt. I ran to the bus stop the next day and I told my best friend, Ricky Sinclair, Ricky, I was baptized last night. And he said, oh. Okay, he didn't think it was such a big deal, but I did. What did you feel like right after you were baptized? Were you constantly trying to learn things that were new? Did you commit to being there every week and you look forward to learning new things every week? You were excited about being able to sign up and volunteer for things. You tried to get as involved as you possibly could. What was it like? Jesus said, yeah, yeah, go back and do that stuff again. Remember the way that it was and renew that relationship by doing those things. He who has an ear to hear, hear what Christ says to his churches. Are we going to hear? Are we going to listen? Because it's very easy for us to get so focused on, see, our our tradition, right, is... um, getting things right. That's what we emphasized in our background. We've got to do church right. Very often we look at the fact that we do communion every week. We sing a cappella. We, you know, we do things that we've decided is the right way to do church. And if we're not careful, that's what our confidence is in. Rather in the connection to Jesus that we had at the first the most important thing is to love God and to love one another as we love ourselves. Love is the, and once we come disconnected from that love, we're disconnected from the power of the gospel. Are we going to hear what Jesus says to his churches? Let's pray together.